Hi, my name is Christina Petersen and I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner and I live in Northern Germany. This is a podcast after a long um, break, but now I start again and I'm so happy that my first uh, guest is someone from the USA and that's Francie. Hi, Francie. Hi, Christina. Thank you for having me today. Yes, and we um, we we are talking a long time about this talk, and now we have the possibility to do it. And um, I like that you maybe tell us about where you are at the moment. Um, and what do you mean by where I am, like physically? I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Yes, physically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, yes, I'm in Eugene, Oregon, and I've lived here for about eight years now. I actually moved to Eugene to do the Feldenkrais training. And where have you, where lived you before? Um, I was born and raised in Oklahoma, uh -huh. which is just north of Texas for people who don't know. But usually they, when I was in Europe, years ago, they never knew where Oklahoma was, but they knew where Texas was. So yes. <laughs> I have to say, I, I'm happy you said something about Texas, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew some kind where, where you are. And um, the, the reason we are talking is you are too a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I like to talk um, with my colleagues here in this podcast about their life and how they got into the method. And do you remember when was the first time you heard about the method? Well, that's the story I tell everybody is how I got into the method. Um, about a year after my mother's death, um, I was suffering from a debilitating pain in my neck. Mm -hmm. I could not move my head in any direction without searing pain. And I didn't know what to do about it. It was getting worse. I even started to develop a trigger thumb and I just was beside myself knowing what to do about it. So um, I was actually in France at the time and I got an email through my grapevine about a woman who had just moved to my town, Norman, Oklahoma, um, who is a Feldenkrais practitioner and she was gonna do a workshop. My daughter is a musician, and so I had heard about, I, it, I was familiar with it, so I immediately signed up for it and started to, and I started to work privately with this woman, and her name was um, Dr. Leah Burney, and the first day I went to see her, um, it turned out she was a retired Jungian analyst who had seen that, and this was what she said to me in the first 10 minutes I met with her, the body holds trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believed her because my neck was killing me. Um, and I started working with her. And of course, she had my neck pain under control within just a few months. Um, but then we started working on the traumas uh, from my early childhood. So um, I knew from the very beginning of working in the Feldenkrais method that these somatic techniques were going to be extremely useful for working through trauma. Yeah, and um, so I know about uh, this connection between, I would say, body pain and trauma a lot because I have also a lot of um, clients and if I ask, often it is they lost someone a year before and this is something which I think I take care about it, that we are not divided between our feelings and our physical structure, which is the soma, and that this all is playing together. And I'm so happy that you um, found the method for you to solve your, your trauma. And what I also understood is that um, was it first a workshop, so the group work with other people, or it was the 
only the lessons with the um, um, the lady. Actually, I think I met with her first. Now that I think about it, and then and then the workshop happened. Yes, and it was interesting to do both. Um, I was pretty dissociated from my body, and um, it just felt really uncomfortable taking that focus from outside of myself to inside. And um, so that was actually one of the things I had to really start working through. And I'm very sensitive with my clients about whether they have that ability to, to bring their focus inside. And I've had clients that do not. That's very difficult for them. So um, um, I had one client who whenever I would ask her where she was feeling it in her body, she'd get mad. <laughs> and I could tell she was getting mad. And so I would, you know, I had to kind of find another way. Um, she could work with touch and with instructions, but really focusing inside and asking her where she was feeling it was not something she could do for a mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. And um, how, How was it for you to the the two different approaches? One is verbally when you are in the group, and how was it for you to to work more guided from the outside about uh, through words? And on the other hand, in the the lesson alone with someone we we can touch, we can guide with our hands to some new um, perspective of how we um, per perceive ourselves. So what was the um, the difference for you or what was your struggle in the one or the other? Well, when I did the the class with her, it was a workshop. I can't remember how many weeks it was, maybe four weeks or something like that. And it was interesting. Um, you know, we did a rolling like a baby. And mm -hmm. I just didn't get it. And, and I remember it took. I t and I tell people this, it took me to I, I just did that one workshop and then I most I just worked with her part privately for years and didn't do any other workshops for a long time. But I remember Leah having me go through some kind of, she'd give me some instructions to do a movement. And then she'd say, isn't that delicious? <laughs> and I would have no idea what she meant by that. Yeah. And it took me a couple of years really to start to understand what delicious felt like. Yeah. So I was just pretty dissociated from my body. I was afraid to be in, um, in myself. And I, I talked to people about um, that a lot of times our focus, and I, I have a PhD in math. So I was just in my head. And that was part of why my body was just starting to deteriorate. I also had arthritis in my lower back mm -hmm. because I was so dissociated from my body. I didn't, I couldn't sense what I needed and interpret that need and then be able to meet that need. And that's something that's at an absolute basic um, skill that everyone needs to have. And it's something that we're supposed to learn when we're infants. And it takes a long time for the infant you know, who's got this grinding in their stomach that doesn't feel good. So they go, wah, and mother comes and says, oh, you're hungry, mm -hmm. and then feeds the baby. And it takes several thousand repetitions of that for the baby to eventually be able to say, oh, that grinding in my stomach means I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's the kind of interpretation that has to to happen and some of us miss that and that's one of the things i think about the feldenkrais method that's so important is we go back to that healing brain space of the infant where we can start to repair and fill in some of those holes yeah um uh i i totally agree and what i sometimes thinks um think is that We, we had some experience in these times, but it's so 
early that we didn't speak in this time or we didn't we we didn't know how to mention but we had such a lot of experiences in these times and now we can it's not only traveling back but if we repeat these processes we can now talk about it and it can be a source of yes for a delicious life <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes. It's, a, it's a fountain of uh, possibilities and qualities we we had there but it wasn't so so aware and uh, only to, to add something what is also in these uh, in the big um, um, treasure of these all I think that's uh, so important to tell why we are crawling or why we are rolling on the floor again in the pattern cross method maybe someone heard about it uh, is, is um, coming into this podcast and thinks okay yes okay or oh, I I should roll like a baby why I'm I'm an adult but <laughs> if we make it clear why it could be interesting Yes, maybe uh, it's the uh, next step really to, to do it or to look deeper in the work. And um, I'm also a very long time a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I would say that it's so interesting. You said, okay, you did a workshop at the beginning, but then you stayed with the work first with the women alone or with the practitioner alone. And I think that's, that was something you were so right. And you had this feeling you should work with her alone. It was the best. So I think it wasn't, wasn't so bad maybe as you thought. And yeah. I would say I, I have some clients, they only do really at the beginning uh, single lessons mm -hmm. and they stay a long time with this and maybe they never enter in group lessons. And I have people... They only do group lessons. And also this is very interesting how this, this comes. Yeah, and the group lessons weren't available to me. She did that one workshop oh. and that was the only one she did. And I think she was the only Feldenkrais practitioner in the state. Oh. This, was, this was Oklahoma, so there weren't, there weren't any others. And how long is this ago? Um, let's see, that was 2009 when I started working with her. And I think nowadays you could, could have find a lot more, um, things in the internet and lessons in groups and also guided, um, more special, um, into this work, but in 2009, so it was two things not only um, um your your feeling it was also by the natural things are going <laughs> and uh, she was um she was older she was um in her 70s and she did not know that there were cds available with recorded lessons and i was the one who figured that out a few years into it and i was so happy because I could never remember the movements when I'd get home to try and do them for homework. And she wasn't very technologically savvy, so we just kind of never did it. But once I discovered, um, and, and it was it was a Cliff Smith, easy hands and arms. <laughs> and the first one I did, it was like, oh, this is delicious. <laughs> and it's, it's one of my go-tos right now for um, for a lot of things like just um so there was when i moved to eugene i was out here by myself and i didn't have any any medical infrastructure and i got a spider bite on my leg and it was starting to just blow up one afternoon and i mean i didn't even know where the closest urgent care center was and so i had to figure that out and i i figured it out and i went and i just shook in the waiting room for two hours waiting to be seen and then had to go back a second time. So I was scared. I didn't know what was going on. And so that was Sunday, it started. Friday morning, I woke up with hardly enough energy to get out of bed. Oh. 
and I knew enough about the nervous system and about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system that I knew I had gone into a crash yeah. that I was having just like, what do they call it when the, your adrenal glands just are wiped out or adrenal fatigue. And so I had absolutely no energy, but I, I kind of had an idea, you know, what was going on. And I got up and I did, um, did an ATM, a really gentle ATM that was just kind of rocking the knees back and forth and the hands and the, and the head. And by noon, I felt better. Yeah, that's the thing um, about the fan cries. Um, it's so good in um, equalizing the sympathetic uh, nervous system. If you are too down, it will bring you a little bit up. But if you are in a higher state, it, it's so nice. Um, yeah, it's more equalizing. Normally, we are too high. I would say in the, the nowadays. So some people think it's only uh, I need relaxation or more more calm thing, or it's too calm and then I'm too spaced out. But you, I'm so happy that you told us the story the other way around because mm -hmm. it can be energizing uh, to do it um, in this moment when you are more in low um, yeah energy. And yeah, low energy. And I, I have found that almost any of the movements that start really moving the pelvis. Yes, will start and be more energizing and especially like rolling lessons are coming up to sitting. Yeah, they're much more energizing. Yes. And also, mm, I, I had just a client and it's a little bit like you. Um, what you told about the neck and uh, this all that um, the pelvis is the center of everything and she she said she can't um, can't uh, take something up from the floor because she feels she is so stuck in the the pelvis and the lower back but she doesn't know how to do and after the lesson with her I asked her she said that And we had quite a nice journey that we found movement in the pelvis and the lower back and a whole like away from the feet to the head and from the head to the feet on the um, bench. And but then at the end, there has to be the integration. And I ask her, please think only think about grabbing something, catching something up from the floor. And where do you start? And she say, with the hands. And I say, okay, now maybe you can move to another place. Okay. I, she was a little bit puzzled. And I say, maybe from the, your shoulder. And she, okay, I think from the shoulder. And then, okay, I said, and what is your pelvis doing? Oh, oh yes, there's movement. And, but I... I didn't say anything about which is like the best or the, the good. And mm -hmm. then she, we played around. How is it to start with the shoulder or with the rolling pelvis and this all? And at the end, she was, oh, it's so much easier when I start by moving my pelvis. And then the, she isn't stuck in the back. And I say, oh, interesting. So you found something and go back and forth between thinking only the hand And this, and she said, it's amazing. Now I'm so movable. And do, do you have some experience? See, all of this, this reminds me of when I was in the Feldenkrais training and I've been playing the piano since I was five, but I played the piano like I was holding onto a ledge for dear life. So I could play the soffigetto, but at the end of it, my hands would just hurt because I was holding so much tension in my hands. So when I got into the Feldenkrais training, um, I started thinking, well, you know, what, what would, what would a Feldenkrais practitioner tell me to do sitting at the piano? And what I do is I just started practicing five note scales and just lifting one hip. And of course I'd mess up the scale, but it's like, I just lifted one hip and I just started mobilizing my pelvis while I was playing 
and then just lifting the hip and then of course it's rolling forward and back and eventually leading up to the pelvic circles on the bench while I was playing scales and it was amazing how engaging my pelvis is what released all of this tension in my hands because my pelvis wasn't helping yeah um but you know this is my special theme to the work with musician i i yeah then yeah I, but just uh, that simple thing was worth had, like a year of a year yeah. or two of piano lessons it was yeah. great yes that's <laughs> Um, I had a new student and she she was holding her hands so much and I said okay you go up and down and think of a jellyfish this is a little bit what's coming into my mind how you play it and the holding that you you stay into a shape but it's the the coming together and this that you are like playing like a jellyfish and then the hands are so smooth and in connection with the pelvis and everything but but we come back to you now oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. i um now i i see a lot about your your wonderful work and your experience but when was the moment you thought about i want to be a practitioner And I want to go into um, a training. Oh, it's funny you should ask that. Because I have, I wrote a blog post and I named it the dumbest wow moment ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, one of the, I had this arthritis in my lower back and this arthritis was gone after the first year of training. And I eventually figured out it was one, I had a frozen pelvis and two, I didn't have a good brain map of my spine. Hmm. I did not have a good brain map of my spine and it got lost. when I did a certain meditation where we were kind of sensing this golden honey flowing down our back and back down our spine, I could sense it through my neck and my upper back. And then I would lose it between the shoulder blades. And then I could sense my spine again when I got under outside of my shoulder blade. So it was just this, this dead zone, mm -hmm. this no man's land between my shoulder blades. And so Leah had done a lot of sensory feedback on my spine. We've just been doing that, you know, from day one. And she did a lot of sensory speed feedback on my spine. So one day I was um, lying there and she was giving me instructions to, to breathe and imagine that I had a ping pong ball that I was breathing up and down my spine with my breath. And so I was imagining this ping pong ball breathing, moving up my spine. And suddenly I could feel that area between my shoulder blades mm. for the first time. And I was so excited. And I think that was when I finally went, wait a minute, this, this is really valuable. This is really going to help me. It, there was something really tangible about it besides the fact that my neck didn't hurt anymore. But then the thing that was so odd about it was the next day I was meditating and I meditate with my in chair position on the floor with my back on the floor and legs up in on a sofa. And I had been meditating for about 10 minutes when all of a sudden I felt like somebody had jabbed an ice pick in the bottom of my foot. And my leg, my leg just flew up and it was this pain, this excruciating pain that just went all the way up and came out my side. So it went all the way up my leg and out my side. And I had to massage my foot to get it to stop hurting. But I associated it with my spine waking up. Hmm. I did. I associated that that sudden pain with my spine waking up and I started looking for Feldenkrais training programs the next week. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, now I know the moment. <laughs> yeah. And what was your idea? You you wanted to go deeper into the work for yourself or there was a clear uh, thought about, oh, yes, I want to teach it to all people. 
<laughs> from the very beginning, I knew that this was a method that was going to be very valuable for trauma survivors. Yeah. And so I took the training knowing I wanted to do that. Yes. And so all throughout the training, I was making mental notes of how this was affecting, um, how it was helping me heal trauma. And um, I do have one really good example. Yes, um, please. <laughs> I, was, I was in, I was doing an ATM, I, I'm sorry, I was doing a, a lesson in the class in the training and um and it was really working that area back there between my shoulder blades and i could sense that those muscles starting to get really fatigued and tired but this was in the first year and i hadn't learned how to take care of myself yet i hadn't learned i mean i was in a group with a bunch of 30 somethings and i was trying to keep up with them and so i didn't i didn't stop and rest enough and so this this these muscles started getting more and more fatigued, but then this emotional reaction started coming up. I started feeling really frustrated. And then these thoughts of, of getting angry with the instructor came up and you're doing this to me. And so anyway, I got through the ATM, but I was so angry at the end of this ATM and we went off to lunch. I didn't even come back that afternoon. I was just, I, I was just trying to contain this anger that had come up on me. And I went in the next day and I told the assistant trainer who'd given us the, the lesson. I said, boy, that, you know, that ATM really made me angry. And he said, yep, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that area between my shoulder blade is a place where that would come up on me at various, during various lessons. And even sometimes just regular stress in my regular life. And what I learned how to do was to take care of it to stop, to, to use the lessons of the method to pause and to take it smaller and to take it slower and to listen to myself and take care of myself. And eventually it, and, and those feelings would start coming up, but I would just kind of acknowledge them and, and understand that it was some kind of old feeling memory that had gotten triggered. And eventually it stopped happening. So this is one of the ways that the Feldenkrais method can be used to help work through some of these, these traumas, um, these feeling memories and flashbacks that can get associated with certain chronic tension and pain in the body. Yeah, wonderful. I thank you, you. I think it was so good explained that even I understood. <laughs> it's really right uh, what I say. I'm serious about it because I work with this so long and I like it so much. But um, what we really do in the Feldenkrais method to come to ourselves and to feel, and sometimes there are appearing um, emotions and to step back a moment to look at these. So everything is like going into a room in these lessons and you use the uh, ATM. Could you explain what you mean by that? Or what oh. we're talking about as, as a Feldenkrais practitioner uh, that, um, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I slip up and everybody has to stop me and say ATM, automatic teller machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, oh no, sorry. Um, it means awareness through movement and, um, and that's what we call our lessons. And it's, I think very important. Um, my assistant trainer pointed out one time that we call it awareness through movement and not movement through awareness. So it's the awareness that's coming first. The movement is not as important as the awareness. And I think that's what awareness through movement really is supposed to signify is that it's not the movement we're doing that matters. It's the awareness we're bringing to it. Yeah. And how we move and what happens when we move in this kind of way and this. And it could be so interesting uh, to investigate this. So I so I like this so much, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and um, 
So you, you, it's so interesting. I had so many um, um, talks with with colleagues, and by the way, that's the reason I do this podcast. Is that I had so many nice um, talks with my colleagues, and I thought, oh, it's, it should be also open for other people because I think it's interesting why we are doing this and what is our thinking behind it. Was what is our special thing in it? And I think this trauma to, to work with this a lot is very important and maybe not so often that people um, go more into this way. So some people catch like me with the sleep or the, the music um, and you took the, the trauma. It's to to be more open to look into this special possible things and to be more open for these things and what do you think is the best thing to talk uh, to work with it so i know you you have that coming something or how do you decide to to bring the work felt christ and trauma to the people um, well, you know, sometimes the trauma comes up just because they're in chronic pain. Um, my very first client, um, came to me in extreme with extreme back pain. And the way I describe it was that she was being tortured three times a week by a VA chiropractor who was trying to correct her scoliosis. Mm -hmm. And so she came to me, she was just in so much pain. And of course, the Feldenkrais method with our hands on work is all extremely gentle. We never cause any pain. And it's just a matter of starting to make these connections. So I stopped trying to correct her scoliosis. And nine months later, she hiked up a local butte here in town. And, um, and it was funny because we were all so happy that that her back pain had left and she still had scoliosis but her boyfriend started misbehaving again and he had misbehaved before and she always took him back but he started misbehaving and this time she broke up with him and i asked her so what's different what's different now and she said and she had had early childhood trauma that was starting to um, emerge and unmask itself through this nine months that I worked with her. And she said, and I always remember this, she said that what, what the work we had done together had taught her was that she didn't have to live in pain. And it didn't mean just physical pain. It's like she learned it at a body level and then it resonated through her entire organism and all of her functioning, her emotional and her mental, she didn't have to live in pain. Yeah, oh, that's really touchy. <laughs> Touch yeah, me. so I don't, I don't necessarily, I, I also am a uh, somatic experiencing practitioner. I finished that training this last year. Um, after I did the Feldenkrais training, I did the somatic experiencing um, training and I call it Feldenkrais graduate school and what it takes a lot of the same the same element the same elements and the same principles that we have in Feldenkrais and applies it to the larger organism of emotions and um, behavior and affect and um, imagination and that kind of thing um, it's just a kind of bigger um, container um, what was I going to say um, Oh, so I, I do do that. And so in that capacity, I have had clients come to me just to work with trauma. But more often than not, they're coming to me with movement issues. And then the trauma unmasks. So yeah. having that. And I'm, I'm so glad that I know you have another training, which is more uh, supporting your skills um, with the trauma because I think um, if you really say I work with trauma 
And the Feldenkrais method, I would say in my perspective, um, yes, I do this too, but not so specialized. So I know about it and I see it, but it's n nothing I would uh, be so... Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's very good that you have another training which is related to Feldenkrais, not another idea that uses something which is connecting the work in the Feldenkrais method mm -hmm. and the somatic experience. Um, from Peter Levine, I think. Yes, it is. Peter, yes. And I think that's really good. And for me, it shows that you really want to go into this. You, you take this method and you have something else into your pocket that you, are, uh, you, you do your homework, I would say, that you really can say to the people, so I'm experienced, I, I have a training in another kind of thing, and I, I like this very much. And um, um, where do you see the connection between the somatic experience and the Feldenkrais method? Well, actually, um, there was a, it's, it, it was one of our little regional guild um, had a had a little monthly seminar, you know, like about an hour and a half talk and different Feldenkrais practitioners would come and talk about various things like their work with children or that kind of thing. And it was someone, it was a Feldenkrais practitioner who had done the somatic experiencing training. And she came and talked for an hour and a half. And that's when it got on my radar. That's when I heard about it. And then when, you know, when I started seeing clients and it was pretty clear that they were going to have this trauma, this stuff was going to just start coming up. And I felt very inadequate to, to working with it. Um, and it just so happened that a training was starting in Portland um, that very following year after I finished my Feldenkrais training. So I started it right away. Nice. And it was just, oh, it was, it was really a fabulous training. I just enjoyed every minute of it. Even when we had to go to Zoom, it was, it was just <laughs> really great. And it was amazing how we could still do this work on Zoom. We didn't necessarily have to be in the same room. Mm -hmm. And as someone who, who now that it is existing, this work, and I heard such a good thing about it, but I don't know much about it. Can you tell um, us, is this more talking? Is it also with, with a kind of touch or lessons? There, there is a lot more talking, um, but there is actually touch also that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, we're, we, we can pick up people's field with our hands. And I mean, that's what we do in the Feldenkrais method. We sense people um but there's it, it's kind of hard to explain um but we do touch work but we also do talk work and i guess the way i would describe the somatic experiencing is that um we think of trauma as existing in the narrative you know in the language-based narrative of the story and it it does to a certain degree, but it actually is an overwhelmed nervous system. So it, trauma actually exists at the bottom of the chain in the instinctual survival brain, in the so-called lizard brain. And the lizard brain does not speak English. I mean, I remember having stage fright attack one time and all of this jury of my professors said, just relax, as if that's gonna help, right? I mean when when the lizard brain takes over and stage fright grabs you, you somebody can tell you to just relax it's not going to help so it's like there's a story that the body has to tell and so what the somatic experiencing training has is a lot of different techniques um that are um very applicable with and and um compatible with the feldenkrais method uh, because it's titration, it's, you know, pendulation, it's, it's, it's starting where it's easy and moving to something that's harder, but then coming right back to easy and making connections and doing all this stuff. 
So we just kind of delve a little bit into the trauma and allow the activation to happen, but then we stop the process, we stay in that activation and let it process in the body um, where the body still has the capacity to process and integrate it. So the problem with trauma is that it, it overwhelms our capacity. It overwhelms our resources to deal with the experience. So what we do is we kind of just delve slightly into the trauma and take a little bit of it and allow that to be processed and integrated. And then it deactivates and then we take a little bit more and there's this building process of capacity. And what Leah told me years ago was that we're draining the energy out of a complex and it's the same idea. Okay. And that's what happened with that, that area between my shoulder blades was I, it just completely overwhelmed me that one day, but having had some understanding about trauma and now about the Feldenkrais method, I kind of knew how to pull back and take care of it and do a little bit at a time until that could the energy could be drained out of that that complex wonderful so yeah that's um so i think we are going to the end of our uh, our conversation so we are in the ending part but that was very nice to see that you have something um even more special for trauma, because as I understand the Feldenkrais method, you can, um, it's not, we are not thinking about so much that's a therapy or really uh, a trauma healing. So it could be that this all happens, but it's more the, we want the awareness, awareness mm -hmm. movement, or we want the functional integration. It's, um, even in the words, we have not so much the idea of therapy or mm -hmm. that that all. But I think that uh, the combination of this, or I know a lot of people who are uh, combining what they have and what they think, they experience other trainings. And I think it could be, it can be so useful, uh, the, the wedding. The wedding mm -hmm. of of it and sometimes it's more this what can support the process and the the more awareness of ourself can help in each situation or can bring it to the surface what is going on and what then to do so uh, what i mean is when i did my training my failing Christ training the, i knew that there came so much up in in myself and so that I had as a guidance it wasn't um, I don't know if about other uh, countries but we have the possibility here in Germany that you will you can talk with someone and it's more a guiding in life situations they are um, they are how to say trained in talking with people and help them to find what is going on where they want to go it's a support and a lot of organizations have these possibility you can go there and you can talk with them and also they can they are trained to see oh oh better a therapy mm -hmm. yes and uh, so you you maybe that's the first step you can go there and i had i think i had very luck with the man I went to and uh, it was so helpful because there, come, there came so much up in the situation of the Feldenkrais um, um, training, my first Feldenkrais training that I found it very helpful. I could talk about it with someone who wasn't also in the training. He knew about Feldenkrais, but and it, it helped a lot. And I think that's really good to um, to have this in mind, what the Feldenkrais method also can bring to the surface. Yeah. Uh, well, I tell people I'm not a therapist, I'm a teacher. Yes. Yeah. That's the, 
That's, and and that's, actually, I, I don't think we heal from trauma. I think we learn our way out of it. It's all about brain plasticity and about rewiring the brain at every level. Yes, very, very nice um, ideas. But um, so to the end of the podcast, I like to ask what, what was what I didn't ask you? <laughs> Is there something in yourself you, you, you say, oh, Christina, could you ask me this? I want to talk about this. Or at the end, this is something very important for me, which should go to the world. Um, I think there was, there's another aspect of the Feldenkrais um, work that's very important for trauma. And that's when I was talking earlier about building capacity, the, the work that we do, especially in the, the lessons that we do where we're just given instructions and we're doing it ourselves and we're instructed to, you know, move your shoulder and feel what it feels like. What does it feel like in your shoulder to lift your shoulder? What does it feel like in your jaw to stick your tongue out? What does it feel like? What does it feel like? And at the end of the, the first year of training, um, I was having a rough time one night and this emotional eruption came up on me. And normally I would have ended up in fetal position sobbing somewhere, but that's not what happened that night. What happened was I went into this Feldenkrais training and in the middle of this emotional eruption, I started going, what does this feel like in my eyes? What does this feel like in my throat? What does this feel like in my chest? And the emotional eruption left as quickly as it had come up. It couldn't take over. And I swear to God, I said, wait, come back. I wasn't finished yet. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like going in and, and getting rid of that inner critic that tells us we're doing it wrong, but bringing in and really, um, being able to um, to cultivate that that observer self that comes in and just can sense ourselves and be present with ourselves just in these classes builds part of that capacity to be able to stay present during these emotional upheavals and to yeah. be able it builds our capacity to be able to process and integrate it yes uh, so um when I did my, my first training, uh, be or before I found the Feldenkrais method, I also uh, was looking for some um, other methods and some, um, or I, I explained about the Feldenkrais method, it's right what you say, you can feel there's coming something up, but you can decide, do, it, do I want to look so deep at the moment inside this because it's all about this asking what is going on and you can rest and you can you can go deeper and uh, but you also can say okay i i know there is something i looked a little bit in this direction but now for this moment i can keep this and I come back to this and it's not more, so for me, uh, if I can speak here also open it, it has equalized. So I'm normally I'm very emotional and it helped me to that I learned I can step back. And um, and I know when I do regular uh, failing cries for myself, I'm, um, yes, I can solve better my daily life or not solving it's a more resilient i'm mm -hmm. very more resilient i can decide yes i look the news but then i say okay stop it um once a day and then i do my daily life and so it's it's much easier that not the emotions taking over me mm -hmm. i'm um, but I, but by this, I feel much better in my emotions. It's not depressed. No, you don't, 
uh, you don't have emotions <laughs> anymore, yeah. but I can um, guide them better. Yeah. Uh, yes. And in so somatic experiencing, what we talk about is that we, you know, we're, we have a, a window of tolerance and that's the, the state of our nervous system where we're in optimal functioning of our cognitive, our emotional systems, all of our physical systems are optimally um, working, but we can't be in that optimal state all the time because things happen. We have difficult circumstances and experiences and we want to be able to um, we want to be able to achieve crash or this very deep rest. And we also want to be able to run for a train or defend ourselves if someone's attacking us. So we want this whole range of possibilities available to us. And do you see how that's very similar to the kind of things that Moshe would talk about? Yes. We want to have that whole range available to us. But we want to kind of be able to we want when we get activated, we want to be able to come back. And that's, I think, what you're talking about is being able to come back to that window of tolerance in that that optimal functioning where we're not activated as quickly as possible. And that's what resilience in the nervous system is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so I know you you're working with it you are offering courses and you I was on your website and it's so interesting what you are offering and also some free stuff is there available and I uh, would say um, I I'm totally convinced your work your work is great <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. So uh, uh, everything got upended about two years ago, you know, when when the pandemic hit, because my my in person practice was just taking off. I had just gotten my eighth weekly client, and then boom, we shut down the following week. <laughs> and it was like I had to go online, and I uh, took a course to learn how to improve my website and. That's what I've been doing during the during the pandemic and taking this training and and I also um, I guess I should also say I'm I'm certified in heart math also I don't know if you're familiar with heart math. No, what's that heart math um, i'm not very good at talking about it yet, but it's. Um, there's a breathing basically the heart is not just a simple pump there's an intelligence in the heart. And Heart Math Institute has um, developed a lot of techniques for tapping into that intelligence of the heart. And it, it, um, it has to do with breathing so that it, it brings that nervous system. It's great for uh, building up a resilient nervous system. Oh, so I, th I think there's a lot more to discover. Mm -hmm. And I'm... All the time very impressed that some people taking so much other um, things into their basket what they can offer and i like that i'm kind of done with trainings right now though yeah, I can understand. <laughs> enough already <laughs> and maybe uh, it's, it's really interesting when when the pandemic hit also i had to move online or to change my habits and i i really was very happy that i did uh, something before like the podcast and the zooming so I was not I, I was familiar with this <laughs> maybe more than other people in this moment but um, all the time I thought okay now I really can show okay I do the Feldenkrais method am I as flexible as I thought I am <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah I think I, I managed it but it was really a very exciting time and I'm happy um, that it uh, I went through it <laughs> and I learned a lot about yes that yeah I would say I, I'm happy with the Feldenkrais method I think it helped me a lot through the the time and all the change and this all this. I'm very grateful with this and you have even more. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I love, I, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's a four year training. So it's not, you know, an easy one and done kind of thing. And it takes a lot of, of 
effort and work to get through it, but I am so glad I did it. It's yeah. just one of the best. It's probably the best thing I've ever done. Oh. It's, it's really, it's made such a big impact on my life and my happiness and sense of fulfillment that I, I just couldn't see not having done it. Yeah, I think that's very good as last words, what you just said. Oh, <laughs> and I would say the same. And really thank you that you talk with me. And I'm so happy you contacted me again that we have this conversation. I'm really grateful for every practitioner who also um writes me and want to be wants to be part in this podcast that we offer a much more broader community our community our fed and crush practitioner community but also that it's spread to the world what we do what we think what is our way into the fed and crush method and really i like it when people also asking me or talking with me and um, doing this and I hope a lot of people will come to you and look to your website and contacting you and asking you uh, do you have some advices for the people uh, how to to get in contact with you or what you offer sure um, my uh, my website is integrated self eugene.com and um I am offering now, I'm going to be starting a series of workshops on res called Resolving Trauma, Connecting with Yourself. And I'm going to have an introductory workshop um, on Saturday, March 12th from 10 to 12 p.m. And that's free online. And you can find the registration on my website um, if you go to the workshops menu. And um, and then I'm going to just start some workshops where, um, and I think I'm doing it a, a little bit the way Leah did with me, where she would just give me some little idea, some little piece, and then we would walk around it and just understand it at every level, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we would just take that piece in and work with it and see what happens. And um, a lot of the workshops that I'm going to do on things like vertical integration and the inner critic um, are things that I know were very impactful for me when I finally started to understand um, how it impacted trauma and how it could help me learn my way out of it. So that's, uh, that's what's going on right now. And I do have a, a, a class also on Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Wonderful. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a nice offer you give to the world. And um, if our uh, listeners and watchers like this, um, sometimes I'm asked if it is allowed to spread it, to, to share the link. I'm very happy if you do this. And I think you too happy when this is um, can get to as many people as we can think about. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me on today. I, I think this is really important. I, you know, the Feldenkrais method, um, I think it's caught on more in Germany than it has in the United States. Um, but um, I just find it to be, I mean, the arthritis in my back, my lower back was gone after the first year of training. And the only way the medical profession was dealing with it was giving me painkillers. And that were hurting my stomach. So I don't, it's just amazing to me not to have that arthritis. In fact, um, one of my, I, I was showing off and for my 64th birthday, I made a video of myself standing on my head. Cool. And, and the thing I tell people is that my, my teacher Leah was 80 years old and she could still get up and down off the floor like a teenager. Yeah. So, this it just keeps a quality of life 
that is just not available through any other means that I can see. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but now we, I think at one time we have to stop and yeah, I, we I think it's pretty clear for everyone that we think that there is a big treasure or a big um, thing what what I hope people are inspired to look into the fan cries world or method that there is something in it which uh, it's maybe not so easy with words only to explain so but mm -hmm. to do the step to find a practitioner in your uh, surrounding online or you it's easy to find in the internet a lot of people who are offering things and Yes, have fun with the method also. Yes, so interesting. I love rolling lessons are my favorite. <laughs> and for today, we, we say goodbye. Thank you that you shared our, your experience with me and us. Thank you, Christina. Bye. Bye. <laughs>